What we gonna do right here is go back. Way back. Back into time. Hey, hey out there, everybody. This is your boy Marlon Ballard with the Love to Laugh podcast. I have a special, special guest with us today. Rob, man. Rob has been killing the game for, for what, two decades now, man? Two, three decades, man? You vocal coach, R&B artist, songwriter, uh, producer. He's, he's done it all, man. And glad to have you, man. Glad to have you Thank here you with so us. Thank you so much, Marlon, for having me. It was so funny. Um, I saw, it, it, it makes me smile when people hit me up and like, oh man, I, they, they bumping your song on the radio still. <laughs> and, and that was in 93 when it was released. You know, what was I, 93, I think I was 18 years old, getting ready to turn 19. I couldn't even get in the club to dance to the record. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I could perform in them, which was weird, right? They, yeah. they let you perform, but you couldn't get in the club. Yeah, to, to I get in the club. Yeah, they wouldn't let me do it, especially 112 up here in Atlanta at the time, which was popping. And um, couldn't even get in 112. It was embarrassing, by the way. Oh, and um, yeah, but um, yeah, that was back in 93. So it was it was uh, an exciting time. So when people hit me up like, yo, they bumping your song on the radio in Orlando. And I'm like, ah, that makes me feel really special because I, I go all the way back then when mm -hmm. they first played it on The Quiet Storm, Bruce Bebop at 102 Jams and Bartell Bartell and Cedric Hollywood, you know, they were bumping the records and, um, and I was really excited. And it was like, mm -hmm. man, you're getting all these requests from all these people. Is that your family just calling in to get it played? It was like, uh, no, it was just spreading. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a big record for me at that time. So that was, that was, that's how I found out about the record. I'm driving and I'm like, yo, I know this song. I'm yeah. like, but I'm like, I forgot who sings this song. I'm like, I heard it, and then I went and did my research. I'm like, Rob, and I'm like, yeah. okay, and I'm like, I know how to say it. Like, do people butcher your name when they see? Oh, they this tear story? it up. <laughs> my 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 name is Robert, by the Robert, way. Yes, but you know the label was trying to be fancy, and they were like, yo, you know, we got to come out with something slick and catchy, and I was like, just make it Rob. You know, like in in elementary school, there were like three three to four Robs in my class. It was popular name Robert there was Robert early there was Rob Rob Johnson there was Bobby and all that and for a while I went by the name Bob in middle school because there was just so many Roberts and my, so you, my so you wouldn't have had to take the one for the team you know I'm gonna choose yeah. Bob I'll be Bob and yeah you see <laughs> many brothers named Bob hey Bob come over here yeah it was never like that yeah so that that was catchy in middle school up to high school but me and a friend of mine that was acting as a, a personal manager to me we was actually um, on this particular street, and we were parked at a light, not parked, but sitting at a light behind a Saab car. <laughs> and I was like, hey, man, how do you pronounce that car name? He was like, Saab. I was like, that's it, Rob. We'll just call it Rob, R-A-A-B. And that, if they don't like that, I don't know what else to do because I, I'm really not a fan of my middle name, James, which is a biblical name as well, which is cool. But I was like, I'll stick with that. And so I brought it to the label, and they were like, oh, my gosh, that's it we got to put some science behind it. And then they went to the Quran and all that stuff. And I'm Christian and they were Muslim. And mm. um, they started to drop the science with the spelling on that, which was cr creative and really cool. And, um, but um, yeah, I came up with the, the R-A-A-B from being behind a Saab car. That's really where it came from. <laughs> hey, that's an interesting story, bro. Hey, just, yeah. but where, where, where are you from originally? I know you're from Florida, but where? I'm from where Orlando. You? Born Orlando, raised, Florida? Orlando, Florida, raised in, uh, well, on Mercy Drive. Yeah, a lot of people know it as Murder Drive. <laughs> but um, I grew up there in uh, Mercy Drive and then Pine Hills area, basically Central Florida area. I, I lived until around 93, 94. I, um, you know, dropped, you know, we dropped the album, we dropped the single that did well. And then I got a chance to work with some other artists. And I'm sure you, you got some other questions, so I won't jump ahead. Yeah. Oh, you, so. you, you good. So from Orlando, Florida. So when did you know that you could sing? Like you like, you man, I could sing. I want to be a music artist. Like when did you know this? Well, you know what? It's funny, man. I really didn't want to sing. I come from a family of singers that sing. My mom mm -hmm. and my sister, they sang in the Florida Mass Choir. My sister was the first female drummer of the oh, Florida wow. Mass Choir. So she was pretty dope. And uh, my younger brother, who's a pastor and goes around the world singing and speaking, 
you know, he was singing and uh, my younger sister sings, but I didn't want, I didn't, I didn't really have a passion for it. I really just wanted to be a superhero. That's it. I tried <laughs> flying, jumping off roofs, climbing <laughs> out of buildings, and that stuff really didn't work. I mean, I could do some of those things, but flying just never, never happened for me. <laughs> but <laughs> but it, was, it wasn't until one day my mom, you know, we were, we have our little jam sessions when we're in the car and we, they would be singing and I would be the drummer beating on the dashboard of the car. And uh, mama um, asked me to sing one day and, um, and I kind of act like I didn't hear her, but she's not the type of mom that you do not not respond to her because <laughs> she has flying fists, you know what I'm saying? The, the ghost like, lap. Oh yeah, well, not even go slap. It's more like a punch in your head, hit the windshield and the dashboard, <laughs> and, and get another hit. Yeah, so she was and driving and not even, you know, that's talent. That's talent right there. That, that, that's a gift. Yeah, in the worst way. Yeah, I was on the opposite end of that. So, but you know, even with that, um, Mama, um, she saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. She asked me to sing, and I told mm -hmm. her, "Yo, Mama, I, I, I really don't do that, and I sound bad. I sound like a frog." And then when I sang. She's like, ooh, baby, you do sound like a frog. <laughs> uh, and, and at that point, that, that drove her, for whatever reason, to put me in the choir at church immediately. So by that Saturday, I was in choir, you know, singing at church. And the next thing you know, they had me leading songs. You know, I would show up at church. Mama, we would get to church. Uh, this guy named John Eason or Margaret Hester and her daughter, um, um, who lives here in Atlanta, who's a big drummer in Atlanta as well. Yeah, LaToya Hester, yeah, who studied, you know, watched my sister play and then, which inspired her and then she's doing her own thing. They would actually give me a recorder, uh, um, a Walkman, and have me go outside and learn a song before it was time to do the song preparation and have me come back in and sing it that quick. Yeah, wow. so they kind of they kind of recognized my ability to do that and um, that turned into me singing in talent shows and um, singing at pep rallies in school. Anything that I could do that revolved around singing, I, I wanted to do that, yeah. So from a guy that didn't want to sing to doing everything vocal-wise. I, I, I <laughs> fell in love with it. Performing oh. on the street, street at um, Church Street Station, which was a popular hangout spot on the weekends. And um, yeah, just, just singing anywhere. Yeah, where I can do it, yeah. Trying so to put together good. groups. Yeah, and all that other stuff. And that didn't, didn't really work out too well, you know, younger, you know, when I was in middle school and high school. Yeah. I understand. So um, who, who was the first person to see you was like, hey, I got to put this guy on record. Like, who, who was that? All right. So this is crazy, right? So here I am. I, I left home at an early age, by the way, and um, dated this, this beautiful girl from high school, you know, and uh, we had kids together. And we put each other through high school. And I think I was 15 at that time. And she was 18. She was older than me. Okay. And um, I was outside, you know, where the cars would be parked. And we were practicing a dance routine for a pep rally at, at school. And my friends, they didn't really take it serious. You know, not all of them. There was a couple that did. But on this particular day, these two guys, they didn't really take it serious. But they were only trying to be in the group to get the girls at school. Yeah, attention. <laughs> already, yeah, I already had the girl. I already had a girl, so I wasn't really caring about it. I just wanted to perform. If we can do, do a performance, let's do it and have some fun and then try, go on to the next performance. And it wasn't until this guy by the name of Tyrone Wilson and Cameron, they saw us practicing and they pulled over and they asked us, could we sing? And at that point, that was my audition, little um, that I knew, to be in their group because right. Tyrone, he could sing. And I looked up to him and he was the one that was like, oh my gosh, I want you to be in our group. And I was in their group for several years. And then they, that was my first opportunity to hear my voice in the studio recording. And when I sang in the studio, I was like, oh my gosh, I sound terrible. <laughs> oh, man. Because the microphone don't lie to you. You know, what you hear in your head is one thing, but then when I started singing in the studio, I was like, man, but I'm not that bad. You know what I'm saying? You know, and then he started showing me and teaching me how to work the mic in the studio, that type of thing. And then we would write together, um, write, do, put harmonies and all that other stuff together. And um, that was the start. So Tyrone, he gave me my first shot um, as far as singing in the studio. And what's really crazy is that Tyrone, 
His brother is Rod Wilson, who married Anita Wilson, who were the background singers for Gloria Estefan. Man. For years, yeah. And when she had that um, tour bus accident mm -hmm. and she wrote the song Coming Out of the Dark, you know, she would go around on her tour when it picked back up and started getting choirs together around the country to come and sing the choir parts on Coming Out of the Dark, We'll See the Light, all that stuff. And then I got to see how music really impacted people, not only from the church, but in what we would call the secular world. And yeah. I don't look at it as secular music. I'm sorry. I've just never been a fan of that term. I just look at music as being Music ministry. is music. It's, it's ministry. It'll, it'll minister you. to It'll inspire you to do some um, positive things or some really bad things. Simple as that. So when I saw what, how Gloria Estefan was able to move and inspire people, I was like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing for a living. Yeah. And um, at that point, that's what happened. So Rod, Rod Wilson, Anita Wilson, and... Um, Tyrone Wilson, who, Anita Wilson, who was actually cousins to Betty Wright, who passed, um, mm -hmm. I think, earlier this year or late last year. Yeah. Later, yeah, earlier, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you about yeah. right. Yeah, so it's, um, it was, it was, yeah, it's a small circle of people, you know, that kind of, you know, saw things in me and pushed me to, 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 to where I am today. So, so. So, so they saw you, asked you to sing, asked you to perform, went to the studio, recorded with them, and then when did you decide, was like, hey, are ready to cut a solo record. Well, it wasn't, and it wasn't then because we were still doing the group thing. So, yeah, you, you did the group for some years. Yeah, right? so how, our how long? Group, yeah, our group was called Tracy Ray, which was, which I thought was funny, because none of our names were Tracy or Ray, but it was just a cool, catchy thing that they came up with. And, it's kind of like Tony, Tony, Tony. Like, yeah, exactly. Tony. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right, cool. And we did some little performances here and there, you know. And um, we were considered one of the groups to pretty much make it out of Orlando if we kept at it. And then I was the type of person that felt like we just can't just pop up and just do a show tomorrow. We mm -hmm. have to constantly practice, practice, practice. Yes. So when we do get an opportunity, we'll be able to, um, you know, kill it, you know, and make exactly. a bigger impact. And then, th th you know, because of life, now that I know better now, but at that time I was really frustrated because we weren't practicing like I thought we should have been practicing and then doing these shows where some of the guys didn't have dance moves or couldn't dance and do the things the right way for us to level up. And yeah. at that point we had an audition to sing for um, in front of Jack, the rapper's grandson. I don't know if you know Jack, the rapper, but Jack, I the rapper, heard the name. Was, uh, Jack, the rapper was one of the first African-American DJs or BJs and out of Chicago at a radio station. And okay. he was known to break artists at his music conference, which used to be massive here in Atlanta called Jack the Rapper Music Convention. That's probably where I heard it since I've been out here. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, that was the first time I ever saw people bootleg t-shirts and, <laughs> and pictures and everything because everybody wanted to be in this convention. And um, yeah. they had this little house that they worked out of in Orlando and we went to audition for them so we can actually possibly perform at Jack the Rapper as one of the groups. And so the, his grandson was um, Louis Bell and then Barry Dufay, who was out of Chicago, who knew Jack very well, who handled bringing in all the acts. So Diddy launched Bad Boy there. Mm -hmm. Martin, the television show, was launched at Jack the Rapper here in Atlanta. Damn. You know, Jermaine Dupri, he was running around trying to show everybody his mixtape. And, and, and because of that convention, it opened up a lot of doors for him, you know, and, you know as far as getting put on and stuff like that. So it was, a, it was definitely a dope convention. Now, when we auditioned for um, Louis Bell and, and the group, they didn't really care to sign the whole group at all. Mm. They got all of our numbers and uh, they sat down and they called, they, they say they called everybody else and, and told them that they weren't interested, but they called me and they said, um, how would you feel about doing a solo project? And I was like, and I was already in turmoil with the group at that time because we weren't practicing, we weren't really doing anything, yeah. you know, and, and life was happening. You know, some, some of them were more focused on getting with girls or whatever or trying to take care of their own selves. But at that particular point, I was like, you know, I got kids. I need to really try and focus on doing this 
you know. You made, a, you made then, an adult decision. Yeah, and then I can bring them along with me if anything pops off, you know, so let me give it a chance. Okay. And so what happened was they gave me a, a $5,000 advance. And um, well, before they did that, I went and talked with the group because at that time I was working at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> 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 The night shift where, yeah, we had to put all the filling in the donuts. I wasn't good at none of that, yeah. Man, but, you, didn't, um, you didn't want to sing. You didn't want to put jelly in the donuts. You didn't want to do <laughs> I, I just wasn't good. I just knew, I, man, if I'm good at something, I'm good at it. If Hell I'm yeah. terrible okay. at something, I'm not going to get in the way of somebody else that, if that's their dream to do it, go ahead and have that. You know what I'm I saying? Understand. Yeah, I'll, move, I'll gracefully move out the way and continue to be a, a, a great support system for whoever that is. And so at that particular point, man, um, I went to the guy, the guys with a manager at the time and um, named Mike Berry. And I went to the house and I said, look, they asked me to sign with them. They didn't want to sign the group. And at that point, uh, a fight pretty much broke out and mm -hmm. uh, a knife was pulled on me. Da, 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 da. And wow. I felt really bad, you know, because I, this was something I needed to do. And although they were upset, and they were upset with me for a long time for it, but I needed to do that. But there, were, there was a song that me and Ty, the guy that gave me the opportunity, we had wrote this song together, and I made sure that we put that song on my album as well. Okay. Yeah. Oh, man, so a, a fight, they, were, they wasn't happy that you went. No, and, not at all. So it's pretty much like in Why the Fools Fall in Love with Frankie Lyman, and they found out he was going solo, and then they was like, yo, it, it was it was bad it was, man okay okay so from then on um you took the deal they gave you they gave you five thousand dollar advance yeah five thousand dollar advance to take care of my family to get me to stop working at the donut shop okay. so i could focus on doing the music and for me being you know raised in the hood man five thousand dollars was a lot of money. yeah that was a come up you know what i'm saying i'm like man i'll take this I ain't got to worry about food stamps. I ain't got to worry about all this other stuff. You know what I'm saying? And I, I was understand. like, all right, cool. I'm sorry. I'm just closing. No, you good, man. You good. Yeah. So I was like, yo, my gosh. Yeah, this is a lot of money. I could really sit down and focus on doing this music. So they brought me up to Atlanta to work with um, a close friend of, of Barry Dufay's, who was the producer. And um, up here to Atlanta to work with a guy by the name of Kevin Kendricks. Kevin Kendricks. I heard that name before. Yeah, Kevin Kendricks is a, was the bass player for Madonna for a while on several tours. He was also the bass player in Cameo, and he was an, he's an amazing songwriter. And later on, him and Andre 3000 worked together on putting all the music together that anything that Dre wrote, they were a writing partner all the way from the stuff on speaker box all the way to the stuff on out of wild the movie etc they did a lot together so when i came up here at that time you know he was still working on doing stuff with escape before escape got with jermaine dupree and then all that stuff took off of them yeah so we did a couple songs and the songs were okay but you know that was, they were they were okay you know and well, what, what were they missing you know, it, it, you know, what's crazy is a lot of artists go through like a developmental process where you're mm -hmm. still trying to figure out who you are as an artist. Absolutely. You know? And I feel like the best work for an artist comes literally from the artists themselves. You know, not saying that nobody can't write anything for them, but if you're an artist, you know, you have to be a part of that writing process. You have to get in there. And he, I was involved in it. You know what I'm saying? But we, we just needed more time for me to develop, you know what I'm saying, into what they thought I should be. But what was crazy is after we did a couple of those records, we came back home to Orlando. And at that point, my brother had a group. And I was like, this would be great if y'all can be in a group and then I could take y'all on tour with me if, I, if that ever pops or comes off the, gets off the ground. Mm -hmm. And so... I knew I was still going to a recording studio in um, called Park Studios in Altamont Springs. I was still going there recording some of these records that they were putting together and nothing was really popping. But when I got with my brother's group, I got to write stuff for them. My brother could play keys at the time. 
And that was the birth of foreplay at that point. Okay. I was writing foreplay for my brother's group, which was called Sela. It was five of them. And um, I was like, okay, I'll write this song for y'all because I felt like when I was in the studio with them, everybody was telling me, okay, you got to sing this this way, do this this way. Mm -hmm. And I, I write. I was writing and coming up with melodies and hooks and all kinds of stuff like that, but they weren't really listening to it. So I said, okay, I want my brother's group to come by the studio and maybe we can get them to do some backgrounds on some of my stuff. But more importantly, I want y'all to hear them because if they, they got it, you know, we may be able to work with them as well, right? Yes. And so when um, we sung foreplay for them, they were like, oh, oh, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> they were like, okay, all right, that's what it is. So as soon as my brother them group left, we got in the car, we had to talk. It was like, okay, I know you wrote that for your brother, brother's group, but you mm -hmm. need to record this song yourself for your album. And we'll get mm -hmm. your brother and them to sing background on the um, album. So I arranged it all. We went to the studio. A guy named Fight Wren did the keys. He played the keys and all that stuff. And CC Lemonhead of 95 South, who made all of, who was the producer for 95 South, 69 Boys, and all that. Okay. He came up with the drum beat, the 808, the kick, using the SB 1200 and some other gear that he had. And and, and there it is. It, it took off. Foreplay. So, so um, foreplay, of course. I know you hate the word secular song. Is this is it's different from what you came up in church. So when when your mom heard foreplay, she's like, "Boy, did was she like that, or was she very you know, supportive?" You know what's funny, man? It's funny is that my mom she was totally against secular music mm -hmm. until before I got my deal, and I had just sung a song for her that was not a church song. Okay. My mom was like, oh, I get it now. She took me to one of these little pop-up shops at downtown Orlando where you can sing a song and they'll shoot a music video behind you, which is hilarious, right? Yeah. And I was doing all these dance moves. And she was like, oh, my baby going to be a star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that happened, right? Yeah. And I, it's funny, my mom passed in June and Sorry to hear that, brother. A box of things that she had left. That videotape is in that in that little little um, container, which is hilarious. How hard is it to watch that? It's really hard, man. It's so <laughs> fun. It's, it's, it, you know, it's like one of those moments where you're in high school and your mom, you know, she puts you in this suit that you know don't look good, but she thinks that it looks amazing. Yeah. But it was me performing. I'm doing yeah. all these dance moves that I. I knew how to do every move. No combination, no eight count, no nothing. As soon as the music, it was a song by Jeff Red called I Found Loving. I'm singing my hands and doing this funny thing like this. And then next thing you knew, the beat dropped and I'm doing mm, 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 killing it. And then every, every time anybody come over to the house, any celebrity, oh, come and watch my baby. I'm like, she showed him that damn video. <laughs> They like man, look at Rob, man. Look at Rob, man. Look at look at him. Come on, bro. <laughs> Yo, you tried to hide that videotape, like Lorenz Tate on Minister Society. You like man, give me the tape. I'm about to mail this off. Yo, about Mark, this I got the tape now. Oh my <laughs> gosh, it is it is it's amazing, man. But she was so proud at that point. So even when I wrote the song. And we had my album release party, which is crazy. So uh -huh. this is, this is, here's another nugget from that whole album. Uh, DJ Khaled and DJ Nasty, they were making beats back then and DJing on the side. They went to rival high schools of mine, them, Wayne Brady, a couple of guys from NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. Oh, wow. They went to Dr. Phillips High School and I went to E High. So we were rival high schools. And at that time, I had covered on the same album, Close the Door by Teddy Pendergrass. And that was DJ yeah. Khaled's first placement off of it for an album or on a, on a record period that went out. Wow. So and people don't know how long DJ Khaled been out. Like he, he's been he's, in the game. He's yeah, been so, out. So on my first album in 93, which the whole album dropped, I want to say... Uh, it was October, November, maybe even January, whatever it was. 
he he uh, that was his first placement on a record. Yeah. So that's like so, that. Yeah. And he DJed my album release party that my mom came to, which I would have never thought she would have come to anything like that. But she was just so supportive. And it Very messed supportive. me up for a while. Yeah. That my mom went against all her beliefs that she believed in just to be there for me, a kid. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, that's, I'm That's what parents do. That's what parents yeah. do. And, and, I, and I saw that, that she passed a couple months ago. And I'm sorry, condolences. Yeah, um, but she she was very hands on with you. I think she did right with you. She supported yeah. you because I think if she didn't, you would have got discouraged, and you probably oh, still would have been at Dunkin' Donuts. Absolutely, <laughs> she believed in me. She really did. Yeah. So when um when fast forward from there, you know the foreplay situation took off, and when the song was played on the radio, she was so proud. Yeah, so proud. The, even the poster that I signed for her, she kept it all this time. It's in that same crate, which is crazy. I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> this, did she have a favorite song off the album that she enjoyed? That Four she for for <laughs> Four play. I'm like, mama, you said your love hot deal down. Yeah. She's like, hey, big girls need love too, baby. I'm yeah, like, oh, man. <laughs> man. Yes. So, yeah. for, so foreplay reached it reached the Billboard. I believe it was at number sixty seven. I believe was it? Um, foreplay. I believe, I believe it was number sixty seven. Foreplay on the well, the plaque is up on this side. Yeah, but yeah. I think it broke the top fifty as far as singles. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, on, on um. Oh gosh, I can't even see. But <laughs> I just started wearing these glasses last week, and they help with all of this. But man, good. But it, it, it was it was a very and I love the song just just based on my opinion. But it, it's a it's a great song and it 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 broke you it broke you into the music industry. It really did, man. It it it, it really did. I, I and once again, I was I would say again, um, um, young songwriters that don't believe that they can write, mm -hmm. but if you're writing melodies and stuff like that, contribute. You know. You know, share, put those ideas out there when they're in their writing and don't just sit back and think that you don't have a, a, a chance to really do something special because they got all the experience. No, no that's not how it worked. Yeah. Yeah. So it opened up a lot of other doors at that time. You know, I was doing performances with, with um, you know, Joe, um, Black Girl, um, the Fugees was doing stuff at Spring Break and... Um, you know, Black Beach Weekend and Daytona Beach, Florida, you know, before MTV came and started taking over their father one following weekend, you know, but, you know, it just opened up a lot of doors, you know what I'm saying, which was, which was a blessing. So, so, you, so you toured for a while after the album dropped? Well, when the album dropped, it was like sporadic shows, like right. sporadic shows and club shows. You know, I did BLS in New York, you know, I did some shows, some dates in Texas, you know, and it was an independent label. It wasn't a major company. You know, once oh, again, okay. it was Jack the Rapper's grandson and Barry Dufay started their own independent label. And at that point, you know, the album dropped. But what happened was when the single dropped, well, actually, people were actually selling it at out of mom and pop stores on a bootleg tape. They were selling wow. tons of it. Yeah. And we premiered the song at Jack the Rapper convention in um, August, the weekend, August 11, 93. And, um, and the single didn't get released in stores, which was a maxi single until October. So imagine the song is being played all up on the East Coast and the South. Mm -hmm. And then some people, it had the explicit sign on it because we were talking about, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, so some stations didn't play it, urban stations didn't play it because they didn't really play bass music like that. Mm -hmm. Not unless it was Friday and Saturday on the mix shows and a lot of those songs were, don't stop, get it, get it, get it. Yeah. it, it was all of that, yeah. you know what I'm saying, which was cool, you know, and I'm from that, you know what I'm saying? And so you never really heard somebody really slow bass music down, put some knock in it and talk about, you know, yeah. just a woman. You know what I'm saying? And that's what, what we did. And it was a game changer. And I felt like we could have had more songs like that, but we were independent and um, trying to get it out as fast as we could. And I think we missed the mark, but you know, we were young. And then at that point, 69 Boys, who was my label mates, 
who mm -hmm. I was really close with, uh, Thrill and Mike Mike, you know, Van, you know, yes. JP and all of them. And that whole bass movement, Tootsie Road, Kanye, yeah. let me see that. Tootsie they Road. were my label mates, and then they took off. I mean, like, they I, did. Oh, Minister Size soundtrack and all that other stuff. And then for me, you know, I had decided to, you know, there was an opportunity for me to have one of the songs remixed, the title track, You're the One, remixed by um, Teddy Riley out of Virginia Beach, which is where he was at that time. And um, they had met with Teddy. And then Teddy, he sent a guy by the name of Walter Mucho Scott. And Walter Mucho Scott, he was the producer for this group called Basic Black. Basic Black was managed by a guy by the name of Gene Griffin. Gene mm -hmm. Griffin had Basic Black and Guy, who are two of the groups that I always looked up to. Yes. Basic Black had a front man by the name of Daryl Adams, Diesel Adams, who I was a massive fan of. I used to dress like him in high school. He was, <laughs> he was just one of those dudes that I was like, I love his voice, even though I love Aaron's voice as well. But yeah, Aaron kind of dissed me at Jack the Rapper that year that uh, I, I had to produce, uh, I had to perform the, the album. I won't say what he said, but I just want, I had told him all, you know, in a nutshell, I had said, yo, Aaron, me, him, me and the girl I was dating and him and the girl that he was with, I had told him, I was like, look, man, you've inspired me as an artist, I'm a massive fan of yours. You've changed my life as a vocalist, da, 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 da. And he said, yo, man, get off my. Oh, man. Play. Yeah. And I was like, OK. I was like, I'm going to see you. <laughs> I'll see you. And it's funny you said because uh, um like I can I can definitely hear Aaron's influence in, in a couple of your songs. I'm like, oh, okay, absolutely. I can I can hear Aaron a little bit. Aaron, I'm like, okay, I'm Charlie like, Wilson. Oh yeah. yeah, big big fan of Charlie Wilson. Big fan of Aaron's. Yeah, and still is. I'm still a fan yeah. of Aaron. Yeah, and um, uh, and at that point, you know, uh, I kind of lost my train of thought just then. But, you yeah, but um, yeah. So that's basically what happened with 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 all of that, but. Mucho, he came in, Walter Mucho Scott, he came in to do the remix for the title track of, this, of the album, you're, you're the One. It was a funky remix, which was cool, but he had another idea. He was like, look, man, I'm putting together like a super group, and, and um, I want to know if you're down with it. And I was like, well, who's in the group? He was like, he had been talking to Joe Thomas. Mm -hmm. You know, the I'm in love. The, uh, yeah, the I'm, I'm in love. love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Things your man won't do. Mm -hmm. do <laughs> yeah, all of that. That was Joe Thomas. So I was like, you got Joe in the group? I just did a show with Joe, and he didn't say nothing. You know what I'm saying about the group? And then he yeah. said he also got Daryl Adams from Basic Black. And I was like, really? Now we talking. I'm like, okay. It sounds like a dope like, group already. That might not be a bad idea. Me, Daryl, Joe, Joe Thomas, and then Mucho. Oh, uh, we about to be a problem. You know what I'm saying? And at that time, I was getting called from the label to go over to England to promote my album. Uh -huh. And I was doing interviews and stuff like that because R&B is really big in England and certain parts of Europe. And yes. I was like, okay, here's a cool idea. And I could go there for a couple of weeks or a month and make some really good money at that time from touring. And um, at that time, I was like, okay, I could do that or I could do this group project. Okay. I'm going to do this group project. Forget the money. Let me go ahead and sacrifice and do that. And then if um, the, the, the solo thing is still popping or have an opportunity to promote both of them, I'll do both of them. But right now, I'll do this group project. It'll be cool. I'll get to sing with a guy I've looked up to for a long time. I'll do all of those things. And that's what happened. So you, so you, did, you went and did the group thing? Went and did the group thing. And did the, did the group thing take off the way you wanted it to take off? Well, here's the crazy thing. We did a song called Cutie. Okay. That I believe um, Chauncey Black from Black Street and Mucho, they came up with the song, Cutie, you make my heart sing. And that was pretty pretty dope. It was pretty funky. We did that. Yeah, did a couple shows, did a little promo thing in Chicago, that type of thing. But D Mucho and Diesel, they were managed by a guy named pops and i was still with my label and um to make a long story short the album 
the, the album that was being put together was what I would consider, and this is no ego involved, mm -hmm. a masterpiece of a, of, of a body of work. Okay. From the singing to the production that Mucho and um, some of the guys did on, the, on that particular album, it was awesome. And it's still one of the most sought after underground albums over in, in the UK and in Japan and, or in Asia, anywhere. And the album, the body of work was really, really strong. And, but you know what, I had had enough because I had put out foreplay mm -hmm. and from my understanding, it had sold very well for an independent label. And I wrote half of the song or at least gave up half of the writing of the song to, um, Barry. And at that point, I really didn't see that kind of money that I thought I should have seen for the single or the album. So I got frustrated. And I was like, you know, what? I'm a, I'm a bounce. I'm gonna leave the industry at that point. You know, without going all in a nutshell about yeah. all these other stories, because there were things that I was seeing in the group, and not necessarily with the members of the group, but things that I thought that wasn't safe for me and my family. And I wasn't trying to go down that road just to make it in the industry. I was like, you know what? I'm going to walk. I'm going to leave. I'm going to go and get a job. I got a job at PetSmart, which is not far from my house. But I was staying off of Cascade. And then I, um, I also worked at Macy's and Office Depot. I was doing all these crazy jobs, waiting tables. And I left the industry cold. Man, and you answered three of my questions right there. I was about to ask. I'm like, why? Because you said the 69 boys were your label mates. Yep. They took off. Oh, yeah. They were gone. And then, like, I was about to say, like, I'm like, you had a, a hit single. The album sounded great. And I was about to say, what happened? Like, why didn't it go further than it did? I personally think, me, and this is just my opinion, I think, and this is no hate on the 69 boys, they, yeah. they were my friends, you know. Even to the point to where when, when I left the industry, Thrill, you know, Van, he actually brought me back in the studio. When I, when I had literally stopped singing, I didn't want nothing to do with it. And he was like, yo, come up here, come back home, um, crash at my place. Yeah, even when I didn't have money to take care of my kids, he put money in my pocket to do those things. And I'm forever grateful for him for that. For that. And I started working on a project with him. Now that didn't get off the ground, but the fact that he saw that, but I had never had no hate towards them and their success. In fact, I applauded it. I celebrated it. I did everything that I could do as far as being a supportive label mate. But I just felt like in my case, based off of the stuff that was happening as far as four players concerned, yeah. And you know what? And I think this could have contributed to it too, as well. I had to do a performance on video LP uh -huh. with um, what was her name? Oh my gosh! What? It what wasn't Donnie was Simpson, but it was the lady Donnie mm -hmm. Donna. I, I forget it. I forget. I was about to say Madeline Woods, but she's on I, something else. Yeah, it was one. It was either Madeline or somebody. But I had to sing "Close the Door" okay. and do foreplay. But here was the crazy thing. I, I was in Orlando and I wanted to go and hang out with my friends at a high school football game, mm -hmm. which was a rival high school, just to go out and have some fun. I got sick. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, the performance, I believe, was on Tuesday. And it wasn't my best performance. It really okay. wasn't. I mean, I was performing, doing my thing, but my voice was darn near gone. Yeah, because um, they're, they're gone. Yeah. So and I think it could, we could say I could point fingers and say it could have been that could have been a part of it. Um, it could have been, you know, the attention being focused on the 69 boys, because when they took off, they were selling records like like crazy. And for an independent label, you don't really have a huge staff at that time. Yeah. Now, because you now got independent a lot going on, now you, they, they went from one small office to a bigger office and then move from that office to an even bigger, a whole floor of a building. And, and I thought the label was doing amazing. I was still happy. I just wanted to make sure that I, I was doing my part as far as the, the, being an artist is concerned. And a lot of that attention wasn't there. And it could have been because of my decision of doing the group project, which took me away from Orlando 
and I was in Atlanta working on that. So it could have been a lot of different things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, I noticed, like, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for live performances, and I, and I did do a little research on you. Did you become very reclusive after you just walked away from the music industry? I became so reclusive to the point to where I just went to work and just only worked to take care of my children. You know what I'm saying? At that time, I was a young father. I had three daughters. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Three kids. And I'm like, I did not want to be, you know, having the cops come knocking at my door because I couldn't pay child support. So I was like, okay, I need to take care of my family. I need to take care of, to take care of my kids. You know what I'm saying? And I definitely don't want them to be in a position where they're going without because, you know, of whatever, whatever. And so I literally just stopped singing everything it's because i i, I noticed because like youtube has everything i was like let me try to find some live performances arrive somewhere i'm like i can't find an interview i can't find a video him singing i'm like he just i shut just, it down i i completely went cold turkey and it wasn't until like a couple years later you know after i left the group some things had happened you know they asked me to put um you know, find another member. And I was like, I'll honor them with that. And that's a whole nother story in itself. And, and I got a guy, another guy, I, I tried to give it to Tyrone Wilson, my friend that gave me a shot. I'm like, here's an opportunity to get to work with some of our heroes that we grew up singing their songs and performances. And when he came up and saw what it was, he was like, he didn't want to do it. And so we called another friend of ours out of Tampa named Marcus Vance. And Marcus, he was cool with it. He got in the group. All he had to do was recut all of my vocals that I had already recorded on the project and whatever new songs that they decided to come up with at that time. And the album was dope. It really was. If, if I had a dream album for my second album, I would have wanted it to be that album, to be honest with you. It was full of great songs. Yeah, and so um, when I started talking with them, the, the label, they, they said, okay, look, we know you're not doing music, da 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 We want to give you another shot, you know, sign you, know, sign you and, and do, well, not sign you, I was already still signed to them, but they were like, let's start working on the next album. And so we talked about it, got a deal together. I started working on the second album. And because of the work that we had did with the 911 album, um, I said, okay, me and Mucho, we can write this whole new album. Mm -hmm. And um, so we did a second album there was probably a couple songs on there that I liked. You know, there's probably a couple songs that I liked off of that. And I was just in a really dark place while recording it, you know? You, know, you, wasn't, like, you wasn't in the mind frame of what you was doing with the first album. First album, you was like, yeah, I'm recording this album. It's coming. Excited, it's coming. happy. The second one, you're like, I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't well, want to. Well, it wasn't even that. I was excited about doing it, but it was like some of the songs... And, uh, you know, I was in a really bad relationship, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. which we kept, which, which was getting in the way. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, some of the songs that we were putting together, I just thought they were just okay, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. And at that point, I was like, this isn't cool. We turned the album in, but at that point, I think um, the IRS had already had issues with the label at that point. And so they, mm -hmm. had, they shut everything down at that point yeah Man, before so that second album could actually come out i would say we probably had two maybe three songs that were pretty strong off of that album and see this is this is like the early to mid 90s so the the r&b competition is fierce at that time you had yeah you, you had like r kelly's tearing stuff up jodeci like you got all these people out so how and at that point mary was on fire mary's on fire so how, how are you in your mind like, man, I got to drop something that's going to, you know, blow that's people away? With that. You know what, man? I just, I never, I never really got involved into competing with other artists. I uh -huh. think if you had something really dope and really catchy, it would have a lane of its own. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? If it was exactly. really dope, if it was really catchy uh, and, and relatable, it would create a lane of, of its own, just like that, you know? And... <laughs> Go ahead. Just, no, just looking back, like you look at every year, 91, 92, 93, and you look at the charts. I'm like, yo, everybody was eating at the same time. 
Okay, yeah, exactly. Multiple people. Now you see it's like one or two people that they let shine, shine. Absolutely. And, then, and Kelly, like, was, what Kelly, was, Kelly was killing the charts. Man. Like, as I dropped four play, he came out with 12 play. play. <laughs> I'm a little 12 play. I was like, woo. So, so your, and, so your, so your four play came a, out first. Yes. And I was a fan of Kelly. Yeah. I was singing Vibe. I was doing uh, oh, Honey geez. Love and talent shows. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. I had the Thames. I had the shorts. I had that. Man, I was I was the R. Kelly of the South at that point. You know what I'm saying? I could do all the riffs. I could do all the uh, – anything Kelly did, I could do that. Anything Aaron did, I could do that, both of them. And so that was my, that was my thing. So when Kelly came out with that, I was like, that if I had to do an album – that was that that would be what the album should have been. Yeah. And man, and you you held your own. I in my opinion, you held your own with that. But I understand your frustration with the with the industry and how everything went. So that explains why you only did one album and yeah. then went on about your business. So you had a family to take care of. You you, you didn't want your kids starving. You didn't want the IRS knocking on your door. And that's no, under, that's understandable. Yeah. So time moves along from the mid to the late nineties. What were you doing around that time? Were you still helping other artists come up or? I was still writing, doing still a little writing. writing here and there. You know, if anybody called me in the studio, blah, 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 blah. I would go and do a little co-write here and there, that type mm -hmm. of thing. And then I'll go back home. Yeah, no. Yeah, so, um, Chris Lover Lover and Poon Daddy uh, have these <laughs> talent shows at Club 559. Ah, uh, that was a hard place. Man. I used to have to perform there, and that was the roughest crowd I probably ever had. Aren't they cold? Man. Man, comedy I, is not welcome. It, it, like, it was welcome, but you had to come out. Yo, if you didn't, you got booed worse than the Apollo. Man, I ain't never seen a boo that bad until I man, moved here. I went in there. I'm like, man, they can boo me all I want. I need to make this money, get this money so I can pay this rent. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll go in there, I'll tell my girlfriend, even though we'd be fighting, I'm like, yo, I'll be right back. I need to go hustle. I never drank, never sold drugs or any yeah. of that stuff. But if it had anything to do with talent, I'm, let me go do that and see if I can come up. And I would go and do those things. I even did Wanda Smith's Wanda. talent show that she used to have. I would go and sneak in there, and yeah. I would go in as Big Willie. That would be my name, in case anybody <laughs> recognized that I was actually the artist singing the artist song. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody catch you? <laughs> you know, one day, one night, uh, when I was leaving the 559, they gave, I think I had one, uh, 150 <laughs> bucks or something. And I was leaving, and uh, Poon Daddy was outside. He's like, hey, man, let me talk to you. And I was like, yo, what up? He was like, yo, you, you sound just like Rab. And I was like, who, 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 who's Rab? <laughs> <laughs> he said, you sound just like him. Oh, I was like, man. man, you look just like Rab, too. And I was like, oh, man, that's cool. What a compliment. Thank you. I'm out of here. Jumped in the car and zoomed down the highway, and they ain't seen me since until later on. <laughs> did, did you admit to them that you that you were Rab? <laughs> later on, but I'm sure they didn't remember by this time. Yeah. Because Chris Lover Lover, Ludacris, yeah. he had become so big and famous and, and everything. He kind of let all that stuff go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Man. So, um... A question I'll back up a little bit. Um, what what was a collaboration that you wanted to have that you didn't get to do? With as somebody? an artist? As an artist. Man, that's a that's a tricky one. I I I actually kind of got to do the collaboration. I got to do it with you know my friend Ty, and we okay. put that out that song on the album called "Give It a Try" that okay. we wrote, and then. I got to sing with Daryl Diesel Adams, the front man of Basic Black. I got to do a song with him. Well, several songs with him off of the 911 album. That was our group name, 911. And we had a song on the Nothing to Lose movie soundtrack called Magazine and all this other stuff. But that was that. But um, I got to sing with him. But fast forward from there, as far as collaborations, I, um, I'm voice coach for Dave Matthews of the Dave Matthews Band. Yes, yes, and you when are. They, yeah, when they had the, um, the, the events that took place in Charlottesville, Dave Matthews, he put on a, this benefit concert to, to, to help the community and help the mother, the family of the daughter that was ran over. Ran over yeah. And on that show, 
particular show, they had Stevie Wonder oh, wow. come up and, and, and perform or sit in and do like three or four songs with the band. And they asked me to sing with them. And I had been coaching Dave for several years, like three, four years at this point. And we had to do Imagine. Imagine all the people. Mm -hmm. And Stevie sang it. And then there's these taglines where he kind of riff and go back and forth. And they asked me to do that with Stevie Wonder. So I kind of, it was like me doing a duet with Stevie Wonder and the Dave Matthews Band in a stadium, Virginia Stadium, in a, at a benefit concert, yeah. And it's funny how stuff comes together like that, because you would never see that anywhere else. Like Stevie you know Wonder, what? Dave Matthews Band, Rob, like this, yeah. that's insane, man. Yeah, and then shortly after that, um, and then that night was pretty impressive. First of all, God is my manager, let me just, let you know that so things yes. when you hear stories yeah god orchestrated a lot of that stuff so that night i had justin timberlake who was actually on the same bill mm -hmm. perform and pharrell on the same bill who performed as well so that was mind-boggling to me and then after prince died i got called to work with uh, uh madonna and um get wind up singing in this tribute um show uh, performance. I think it was the Billboard Music Awards in Vegas at that time when they opened T-Mobile Arena mm -hmm. and she did a tribute to Prince, the only one that right after he died. To I do think I movie. remember that. I remember that. Yep. So I got to sing with her and guess who was singing with us? Stevie Wonder and Madonna and I was yeah. on stage singing background for that as well, which was a blessing. So I kind of kind of got to got a chance to work with some of my my heroes. Well, a lot of them, yeah. So um, after after you took a break from your career, when did you decide, it, like, hey, I want to be a vocal coach? I want to teach people. Oh, you know what's crazy, man? I never aspired to be a voice coach. Mm -hmm. what, what, what pushed you into that? I was a vocal producer. Oh, and oh, okay. As a vocal producer, vocal arranger, you know, it's funny. My friend, Fight, who actually did the music for um, Foreplay, the keyboard player, Playing, he wound up having a really successful career working with Backstreet Boys, working with NSYNC, all of them out of Orlando, which changed his lifestyle as well. And um, um, during that time when I was slowly making the comeback, he had called me to come in and do some writing with him, or I would bring writing projects with him. And this particular artist that he had me to come in and do some work with, it was for Jennifer Hudson. Okay. And Jennifer Hudson had gotten kicked off of Idol the second time and uh, she was doing the cruise ship gig and then she would come over to Orlando and work with Fight when she was off from doing cruise ship. And so he had me come in and do some writing with her. I did a duet with her called Ghetto Love, which was actually pretty cool at that time. Okay. <laughs> and me and her still laugh about it when we do talk. <laughs> yeah. And so we did that and um, Fight winded up um, being instrumental in helping spark that writing thing back up. But while I was in the studio writing or arranging vocals for singers, I always knew that singers would get tired vocally, but yes. didn't know how to fix it besides telling them, all right, let's go and take a break. You know, some will go and do a smoke break. Someone will go and get something to eat and come back. And then the voice just still wouldn't be right. And I'm like, what's that? You know? And it wasn't until, um, I had started singing on the praise team at church again. And the bass player, who was actually the bass player and musical director for Escape, for Jagged Edge, and mm -hmm. he was actually Walter Mucho Scott's brother named Zach Scott. And when I joined his church, me and him, we were like, oh my gosh, we got each other. It was pretty cool. And he had told me that Daryl Adams was in the studio, was called to the studio in Virginia Beach to sit down and meet with, um, you know, Justin Timberlake. And mm -hmm. him and Pharrell was finishing up Justin's album and Justin was looking for two singers to go on the road with him. <clears throat> and they hired him on the spot. And mm -hmm. then they asked him to call and get the other guy. He called me. And nine days later, I was out in LA singing background for Justin Three days into me being out in L.A., I met Justin's voice coach, who changed my life. She knew everything about the voice. 
she still to this day is the dopest vocal coach that I've ever worked with. Her knowledge, her everything about the voice blew me away. And even then, I wasn't even trying to be a voice coach. I just wanted to be a better singer for the gig. Yes. And because of that information, she, I would follow her around and ask her tons of questions about the voice. And then it wasn't until 2006 she fell ill. Oh, she man. fell ill and she passed. Oh, but before man. she had passed on the pre previous tour, the Justified tour, she had give, given me a CD of vocal exercises to work on my voice, work on Justin's voice, and any other singers that wanted to have that ability, you know, to warm up before shows. And I still carry that CD in my backpack everywhere I go in honor of her. And one day, God told me to train as many singers off of that CD that I could. And look at you. And he told me a thousand singers in a year. And I was like, okay, I can do that. And it was around, almost around this time, around September, when I was frustrated because I had only had gotten up to 287 singers. From the top of the year to September, I got home, upset, having a pity party, angry with God. Like, is this some kind of joke? You want me to work with a thousand singers knowing I'm only at 287? I've, I've been rejected. I've been embarrassed. Yeah. People have put me down. I've gone to people's churches and offering them free lessons only for them to reject me. I was like, I'm doing what you told me to do. I was like, but, but the few that he's given me, it was 287. That's still a lot of singers, right? That's a lot. So one day I'm watching Karate Kid after church, having this pity party. And I'm flicking through the channels. First, the, the channel before I get to the, the main channel, somebody's laughing hysterically on TV while I'm having this argument with God. I'm, I'm the only one arguing. He's not. Yeah, so I'm hearing laughter like he's laughing at me, right? I'm like, how is this going to happen? Da, 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 da. I change the channel. It gets to the Karate Kid. And it's where Mr. Miyagi and Ralph Macchio, Ralph Macchio is fighting with Mr. Miyagi. When you go teach me karate? He's getting yeah. kicked every single day. Yeah. And then I'm like, see, that's what I'm talking about. You got me working with a thousand singers. I ain't going to even make it to the end of the year. I'm at 287 singers. And, and change the channel. There's more laughter. And then I started to get quiet. Then my daughter runs in the room laughing, falling on the floor with something she just saw on TV, laughing. I'm, ag I'm agitated. I'm angry. I'm like, get out of here, boy. I ground you, da da da. Yeah. And then at that point, I'd be still. And I'm like, it was never about a thousand singers, it was about the quality of singers that I worked with. It was always about that. And I was like, all right, all right. I'll never count how many singers I have. I never count how many is on my roster. I it would always be about the quality of yes. every artist that's in front of me. I will give them my very best. I will let God lead and speak, and then I'll just do whatever the work is that needs to be done and just keep it moving. And at that point, all this stuff just took off in an instant. Man. Wow. So, so I, I would I would have hate to see you tear up your room while watching the Karate Kid going through a temper tantrum like oh, that. Oh, I was mad. <laughs> I, I was upset. I was annoyed. You know what I mean? I mean think about it. I yeah. go, I'm going to church where most people need the most help. Some of the yes. most talented people or, or singers, but some of the ones that really abuses their voice. And here I am giving them this free information mm -hmm. to help and was getting rejected left and right. And it, get, and it does get frustrating, but like, look, look at you now. You work with, you didn't help Justin, Madonna, Dave Matthews, Rihanna. You didn't, you didn't work with the best in the business. And, and I don't. And and now that I know this, when I listen to the records, I'm like, yo, that's Rob. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's Rob. It's, it's him. Like without him, they wouldn't sound this good. Like they, yeah. they, you, you have your touch on people. So really, you're still in the charts out here. You still. You're still trending. Praise yeah. God. You may not be the face of it, but you're like you're you're we you're what we hear. And and I appreciate you for that. Like and that's and that's why I started this podcast. I'm like, yo, people don't know this. And plus you don't do interviews, Rob. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so I I I'm I'm glad I got 
like got you to say this on camera because I'm like, yo, this this can lead to another lane. They're like, yo, if they listen to this, they like, yo, Rob was on to yeah. something. Let me listen to this brother. And then they yeah, Rob's great, man. It wasn't until it's funny, Aaron Camper, who's doing his thing. Mm -hmm. I met him singing background with um, Justin. You know what I'm saying? That was a, a w interesting transition spot for me as well, because I was singing and coaching him on the road. But mm -hmm. then when our music director, who was actually working for Madonna, couldn't come back, he brought in Adam Blackstone, who I've become close friends with as well. And of course, when you bring in another music director, it's their prerogative to bring in their own team. Mm -hmm. And because of the stuff that I did from, with Justin beforehand, uh, going above and beyond the call of duty. And what I mean by that is one of the things I did as a background singer for him, I was uh, the one that was like, oh my gosh, how can I make our job easier? You know, let me make our jobs easier. I'm going to print out these booklets. Let me talk to the music director. Hey, do you have a list of the songs we're going to sing? All right, cool. Send that over. I'm going to get all the lyrics. I'm going to go through them all. I'm going to put them in these binders. I'm going to highlight all the, 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 the background parts, and I'm going to make a booklet for all the singers. If you got pictures of them, I'm going to put their pictures on the back of the book, put Justin on the front of the book, put mm. their name. I'm going to make one for the music director. I'm going to make one for the artist. I'm going to put pens, notes, warm-ups, everything in there. And then when I show up, I'm like, this is for you, this is for you, this is for you, this is for you. This is the least. So we don't have to stress about the job. That's one thing. And that was my thing. And they never asked me to do that. And then at that point, he asked me to be the lead, the section leader. And I, he didn't hire me. He hired my friend, Daryl. Daryl got me in. And I asked him, hey, why don't you give that to Daryl? You know, but they felt that I was the better one for that job. You know what I'm saying? And I still honor him as well. Mm -hmm. But going above and beyond, which opened up doors. So when there was a shifting of the guards or a changing of the guard, when, it, when Adam came in, he brought his whole team in. Okay. And by him bringing his whole team in, Justin still wanted me there because of what I had done previously. Yes. And so I'm still working for him today. And that was back in 2002. And so- In about 20 be, years. Man. That's a lot, you know what I'm saying? So that went from Justify to Future Sex Love Show mm -hmm. and then all these other projects that I worked with him on. And then when he did the 2020 record, that's when I came back in and there was a whole new team. And that's how I met Adam Camper. Okay. Now, uh, um, Aaron Camper, I'm sorry. Aaron, Aaron yeah. Camper, who's an artist, who's a background singer in there. And I arrange all the vocals for the tour. I don't do it for the album, but I just take, and what I mean by that is, he was another thing going above and beyond is that anytime we had to work on a song, a lot of times singers wind up fighting with each other. Well, you sing this, you sing this. Well, you sing this, you sing this. And working with Robin Wiley, who was Justin's voice coach before she passed, she had a system that I thought was amazing. She would sit down, we would go over parts. She would let me arrange with her on um, a couple songs. And um, at that point, she was like, okay, this is your voice type. You're going to sing tenor the whole time. You're going to sing bass, baritone the whole time, alto, soprano. And then if that's what your voice lies, you're going to do that the whole tour. And if that's what you're used to singing, it should be a walk in the park. Simple as that. It's all the jumping around, which can cause a person to tire out or fatigue quickly. So I was like, okay, that's a dope system. Well, why don't I do this? Let me take it a step further. Let me record everybody's part per song, give them an acapella, Give them one with the vocals turned up, the track turned down. Give them one with what it sounds like. It'll be like four or five um, versions of one song. That's what I would do. And send all that to all the singers. So by the time we would get in rehearsal, we were always ahead of the band. We could get more days off because we were already prepared. Yes. And anytime the music director had a different arrangement, he would give it to me. I would create it. Or sometimes I would get with the singers and like, what do y'all feel? What do y'all think y'all should do? Because y'all going to be up here performing. And a lot of times they would just go with what we had already created. You know what I'm saying? And then it made it easier for them to do other things outside of being hired on that job, which I felt was a major contribution to Aaron Camper and his career, being able to perform at the tiny desk and, and touring all over the world on his own projects, as well as uh, Kenny Dixon, Kenyon Dixon, or Xenia, or... Anybody that's doing background singers, singing, a lot of those singers are just as strong, if not stronger, than the lead singers that they're singing behind. Exactly. So 
I wanted to make sure that their jobs were super easy. They can come in, I'll bring gifts and do all kinds of cool stuff to make sure, let them know that somebody cared and went above and beyond. You know what I'm saying? Even vocal maintenance and taking care of them and working with doctors and all that other stuff to make sure they had everything that they need and then some on the road, yeah. See, that's what people don't see. Like from from, oh, yeah. from the from the fan point of view, we pay the money to go to the concert. Oh, yeah. We sit in the crowd and we're like, "Bravo, give it up for Justin!" Like we forget everything that had to come in fruitation to get to where he is. So I'm like, you, you got the background singers, you got the other people in the back. We like we don't know what they're doing, but I'm like, they're here for something. So now Absolutely. that you explain that, I'm like, okay, yeah. that's what that is. Okay, yeah. and all the way from the text. The a lot text. of people don't notice is that the technicians, the, the lighting guys, the riggers, those guys go from tour to tour to tour. They constantly work. Yeah. Right now, it's really challenging for them right now because of COVID. But yeah. a lot of those guys, they constantly go from gig to gig. And sometimes artists or, or performers forget about them and don't really hang out with them. Me? Man, I hang out with everybody. Yeah. I go and hang out with them. They're like, well, what you doing over here? I'm like, man, how y'all doing? We're a family, aren't we? <laughs> what you and doing here? Like, like you can't hang. <laughs> or they, they'll be in shock because most people don't take the time out. You'll yeah. be surprised how many artists don't know the names of their, their, their people that yeah. work behind the scenes. I don't want to be that guy. Even if I was the superstar, I always took it to heart to make sure I knew everybody. I, I would make, I'll mess up your name, mm -hmm. but I but remember you know the story. I remember our stories faster than a name. I remember faces while well, I'm better, better than I do that. You know what I'm saying? So I always made sure that I always had a relationship and talking with them. And one of the um, production managers was a guy named Anthony Giordano for Justin for years for NSYNC. He worked with Michael, worked with Prince, worked with some everybody. But he was just a funny guy. And I will always, anytime I see him go and spend time with him, laugh, not because of who he worked with, but just to laugh and have a good time. And you'll be surprised that sitting down, chopping it up with somebody, how much that makes them feel. And you don't really realize how much stress goes on with putting these shows together or something breaks down, in panic mode, and then they're worried about being cut. You know what I'm saying? So by me doing that, it brought a lot of sunshine to a lot of people's lives. And so... This dude saw what I was doing with Justin on tour with him. And then that led me into working with Dave Matthews. Man, and, and, and my man. first day on the job working with Dave Matthews was when they had the final four at Centennial Park, where the, the NCAA tournament, the, the games were being played at the Dome, yeah. the Oaks Arena. And Sting was on that same show. And while I was warming up Dave Matthews, Anthony pushes Sting in the same room, and now I'm warming up Dave Matthews and Sting the first day on the job. And you know what's funny? God told me not to charge them nothing going in. Don't charge them a thing. I don't care what happened. Don't I'm like, God, I wasn't going to charge them nothing. I'm just going to help out. I wasn't even trying to get a job. Let me you just go and help. It. You the love of it, man. Just let me go help. You know, if you don't need me to sit down and talk with somebody about the voice, I can do that all day in my sleep. Yeah. Let me Dang. go and help, and hopefully that will the, the thousand singers that's where all that comes from okay whether they like it or not you know what i'm saying rejection or not let me go and just give them this information and see what they do with it because if god sent me i need to be obedient to that not what they're gonna their response to it is because god we ask god for a lot of things all the time and we reject it now nah, that ain't for me lord that's for marlon but you know you got us mixed up on this line and you know what i'm saying <laughs> we got a heartbeat and miss out on blessings right Exactly. So I did that, and while I'm in here working with Dave, they even push Sting in the same room. And Sting's like, I need to warm up too before I go out there. Keep it going. Ooh, just, just don't. And just go right into it <laughs> right away. So at that point, I'm like, wow. Then they tried to pay me. I'm like, man, y'all don't get out of here. I should be paying y'all for what just happened. You know, so just being a, a servant and serving and honoring people and absolutely that kind of love, that those things are – more important to me and more valuable to me you know i think i think honestly brother i think you got your just due like from all the stuff you put up with to up until now like you you crossed over into other genres not just r&b you dave oh. matthews i believe like you rock pop r&b hip-hop like you you stretched out over 
a couple genres. So and, hey, and here's, the, here's the crazy thing, Marlon, is that all those things that I was working on back then as an mm -hmm. artist, arranging and writing and not being afraid to, to throw my ideas out there, whether they stuck up or not, mm -hmm. you know, I I just got the vocal produced legendary rock band Fish's album that just dropped three months ago. The whole album. Oh, man. And even in, we just did quarantine. I call them quarantine sessions, but quarantine uh, the sessions. front fan of the band, Trey Anastasia, he was working on on um, just writing these songs and making up stuff around the house. And that turned into an album, which dropped three Fridays ago. And I was able to work, do four songs on that, you know, arrange vo vocals on four songs. See, on you working, you, know, you so working. God, God's always up to something, man. I just want to be pleasing to him. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And honor him and, and be able to show his light and his love through me to all these other artists that I get to be blessed to work with. You know what I'm saying? So those things are valuable for me. I understand, brother. And since we're, we're in this day and age now, we're in 2020, and, you know, R&B has changed. Music has changed, period, but mostly R&B. And um, two questions into one. What advice would you give the new R&B cats coming up right now and what do you think they should do business-wise when it comes to their career as far as not being on shows like Unsung for signing bad deals? Because that's mainly what that show is about. Unsung is like, hey, I signed a bad deal. This is what happened. I'm in the gutter I mean, type I, thing. I mean, you think of it like this, man. It's, it's, it's unfortunate because a lot of people that are doing not just R&B, but you know, that's coming from where I come from, we didn't have much, mm -hmm. you know? And the thought of, man, I'm about to get signed. I'm about to do this. But what does that mean, really? You know, and um, are you going to take the advance? Because you got to pay that money back. You do. Then that's you what know? they don't tell you. They just With like, here's $20,000. This yours. It's not yours. With it's interest. With it's interest. Cases. You know what I'm saying? And those bills keep piling up. My advice to the up and coming R&B singer, be true to it. Mm -hmm. Study the greats. Mm -hmm. Study all the ones that have come before you, rather they have been a one hit wonder, you know what I'm saying? Uh, rather they had some success, whether you like them or not, they all have something that you can learn from if you have an open ear, heart, and mind to receive it. But in that case, study them. All right, people quickly go to Brandy, go to Brandy. Go to her first album. Go to all of her albums. You're definitely going to be in for a vocal master class. Definitely off of Brandy. You know yes, what I'm saying? Sure. I'm looking forward to that Versus on Monday, by the way, her and Monica. That's going to be, that's going to be interesting. I got to tell you, I'm looking forward to it, too. You know what I'm saying? I think and it's going to, I think because of COVID and what's happened to the industry, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a needed thing to bring us all together. You know what I'm saying? Regardless of what you may have heard in the press about their relationship, yeah. non-existing relationship. And I've been blessed to work with Monica. And I love me some Monica. She seems like a sweetheart. I never got to meet her. She seems like a sweetheart. You want to see a real people. one? You want the realest? Her yes. and Rihanna. They're the realest. <laughs> man. They're man, the that, realest. Those are my two crushes right there, man. I, like, I'm like, man, I'm going to marry one of them. I don't care Good which love. <laughs> Good love. <laughs> But no, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I came close to working with Brandy a couple years ago, and that fell through for whatever reason. But um, I would have enjoyed working with her, too, you know, helping, you know, the same thing. I got called to actually help Aaron Hall. Oh, wow. Know, that's crazy. And Did that I think, happen? I think when he found out who I was, I think that's when he stopped answering my calls, which is <laughs> funny. Yeah, because here I was, and I wasn't going in to be like, yo, man, you dissed me. No, yeah. I'm like, let me help you. Let me help you get back. You're one of my heroes, you know. And um, you said duets. I actually got to coach Uncle Charlie, who was my hero hero. Uncle Charlie is the godfather of a lot of singers yes. that came out, man. And, and it's funny, before this COVID thing happened, I had ran into him in the airport coming back from, I think it was L.A., but I ran into him, and he was just the kindest person to me. Every time he see me, you know, and him and his wife, so precious and so sweet. 
we sat down. He was talking about his new Valentine's Day single that was getting ready to drop. And we were going to work together again. And I, I paid for his breakfast and everything and then ran and got on the plane. He don't, I don't even think he know I did it. But, yeah. But just to honor people, which is so sweet. Yeah. But, um, but no, um, with the R&B cats, I, I see I get off track sometimes. No, you get me. You get it. R&B, st- study them all. Go back. Mm-hmm. You know, go back to Earth, Wind, and Fire. Go back to, you know, anything and everything Aretha Franklin, Shaka Khan. You know what I'm saying? You know, the Gap Band, SOS Band. Go back. That's, what, that, that's music that you can feel. Like now when I turn on the radio, I'm like, I'm like, you really wrote this down on a piece of paper? You, yeah. This is what you did? And okay. talk about something. Okay. Talk okay. about something besides having the Bugatti. Okay, because exactly. if you had to get a get the brakes done, brakes fixed on a Bugatti, <laughs> come on. There, there, there's your advance right there. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. This is going to be $50,000 for that alone. Just the brakes. Come on. And it's like, man... Talk about some stuff, because the thing that when I started um, crossing over and working with other genres, from country artists to, to pop artists or rock artists, man, you kind of wonder why Dave Matthews has been touring for 28 years. Yes. Selling out all summer. Every time. You know what I'm saying? Or a fish can sell out 13 nights at Madison Square Garden. And don't have a song on the radio exactly. right now. Timeless music. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So really be, if you're going to be, you, if you, I know people try and make the perfect song lyr- lyrically, but just really talk about some stuff that really touches the heart of people. You know, and I, I miss hearing love songs on urban stations. I don't hear I them. Do. I do. I hear women getting called out their name. I'm like, how many times are they going to let this just keep flying? Man, we, you know, want to hear some love songs? You got to wait till eleven thirty at night to turn on one hundred four. Oh gosh! <laughs> or, I'm, or I have to go over to Delilah for a minute. Delilah, <laughs> I'm like, why am I on this station? You know what I'm saying? But, but I, I want to hear hear love. You know, yeah. I don't. And there's a difference. And, and, th- and those artists are out. They're just not pushing them the way they're pushing the Bugatti people. They're just yeah. Like, they're not. Yeah. They're not. You know what I'm saying? And so my thing is, if you're gonna do R and B, you know. Be true to the art of R and B. Exactly. You no, know, I, I understand there was trap soul, there was trap, there's trap soul, there was this. Trap but everything. the evolution of I remember the days when and I'm from those days where you had R and B song and you had verse chorus, verse chorus, and then there was a bridge. The bridge was either a musical bridge, normally mm-hmm. a saxophone or a keyboard solo or a guitar yeah. solo, you know, or there was a singing bridge there that really brought the song to this climactic part, which was really awesome, which actually made you want to buy it. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's and, funny. Now, and then it went through a period where they took those eight bars and turned them into 16 bars and let rappers get on. And I coach yeah. rappers as well. Yeah. And I love them as well. And they would put 16 bars there. And then the rappers were like, man, I can sing my own hook. Or I can get the R&B singer to sing the hooks and then I'll rap on every verse. That happened. And then it went to the rappers like, I'll sing my own hook. And then that has been happening. Yes. And then it's like R&B had just gotten lost in a lot of that. It did. You know what I'm saying? And, and for me, when I hear that, it's like, dang, we, we've, we've missed a lot or we've neglected it. Neglected it. And even in the charts, exactly. like, yeah, in um, the Grammys, it was no R&B category for a minute. R&B soul you know and, and then and the other charts as well so a lot of that stuff was was missing and i don't know if it was had to do with people saying oh people ain't really into r&b anymore they don't, they don't sell it could have been some of that mm-hmm. you know but i just think at the end of the day once we went um to social i mean streaming and stuff like that and you're able to preview an album like an itunes or whatever Mm-hmm. You know, at that point, people can, they can hear if you only just put three strong songs and then put seven album fillers in it, you know? And so Man. now you have to do a dope album from beginning to end. Exactly. Because right now you can just drop a single and then be hot for the summer, tour, make your money and just disappear forever. I'm like, it's yeah. a couple people you haven't heard from. I'm like, that was a good song. What happened? And then 
I'm like, yeah. one, that's it? Okay. Real quick, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so, and then I'm working with, like, some artists that are really dope, you know, really, really fly up-and-coming artists that's doing the R&B, you know, mm-hmm. Kenyon Dixon, you know, once again, Aaron Camper. Yes. Uh, Amber Riley, who's uh, just performed last night on um, Kimmel. You know, she, you would know her from, um, oh gosh, I keep forgetting this singing television show. I think you oh, promoted gosh. her the other day. You put her on your Instagram, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. But her EP, oh my God. I'm going to have to check that out. Ooh. I'm going to have to check that out. Her EP is, is out of control. There's this young kid that I've been working with named Brooke Graves, who's, she, she's white. But she's just R and B. So hey, we we accept white R and B artists. We got John B. Uh, you know Robert what I'm Dick, we got a mother. And plays keys and everything. Like really, really strong, strong artists, man. And right now, you know, all of my clients are in the studio recording. So once we're able to do large gatherings and concerts again, we're gonna hear a plethora of good music just coming out at once. Okay. And and so I'm really, really excited about a lot of that. Awesome, man. Hey, you gave me a great interview. I ain't gonna hold you forever. I'm gonna just go ahead and right. wrap it up. But I'm gonna let you. Um, are you working on anything right now? Like you promote a business that you have? Um, just let the people know where to find you at. That'd be um, lovely, dude. You can find me on Instagram at um, Robert Rob. That's R O B E R T R A A B on Instagram. I'm constantly putting up crazy stuff. Me losing weight, getting healthy. Um, um, you can go down the timeline and see some of the stuff that I've done with artists over the years where, you know, they're out performing and, or I'm out working and doing stuff like that. You can catch that. Or you can reach me on my website at Kamad, that's K-I-M-A-D productions. That's with an S dot com. And you can see some of the artists that we're working with right now. Um, like that, you can do that. But, um, I'm working on putting um, my app back up because when Apple changed their operating system, you know, they changed all the coding for everything. And we, uh, we had my partner, Mindy Pack, we were in the midst of doing a massive update on the app. And once that happened, we had to almost not necessarily start over because we have all the content. Mm-hmm. But um, every programmer that we had hired have gone to work for Apple or Google. You know, oh, they hired all of our people. So, and we, we're not hating on them. Yeah. But anybody else that we brought in, they want a whole lot of money to do something that it, it, we know what it is. Yeah. And yeah. then what they do is they see our roster of clients that we work with. And um, from there, they're like, okay, we need $100,000. I'm like, no, you're not going to get $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. last dude didn't even want this. So, why are you? Yeah. yeah. So, we're in talks right now with another company to actually put, put the app back up, which will help people have a voice coach in their pocket when they can't afford my rates or any other coaches' rates. Or even if their co- they have a coach and their coach can't be with them, they'll have a pocket full of vocal exercises that they can work on. Yeah. That's Excellent, it. man. Hey, Rob, I really appreciate you for this interview. You got man, it. Man, I think this will be your only interview on, <laughs> on, <laughs> on YouTube, man. So I really appreciate you. You're a dope artist. I continue doing what you're doing. Um, I, you'll be hearing from me. Hey, I might need some vocal. You never know. I might come right. in. I work with public speakers as well. <laughs> hey, awesome, man. Hey, thank y'all for tuning in. This is Marlon Ballard, my special guest, Rob, and this is the Love to Laugh podcast. Thank y'all for tuning in. Peace.